Hello and welcome to the strange and wondrous life of functions in Rh. In this talk I will take you on a journey into the lands of the R language. The first part will be about R itself, then I will introduce our work on a JIT compiler for R we call Rh. Let's have a look at the beast we are dealing with. For people not familiar with R, it's a language for statistics and graphics from the 90s. It is still very much alive, has thousands of packages, an active community and a dedicated conference. It is also notorious for its dynamism, and when you try to compile and optimize it, it feels like the language is fighting you and actively trying to make your life as difficult as possible. The focus of this talk is on functions, so let's start with the birth of a function. The first thing to know is that in R functions are values. They can be created at runtime and passed in and out of other functions. Second, all R functions are anonymous and naming one is only a matter of creating a binding for it. Throughout the talk I will show bits and pieces of the GNU R source code written in C. As R doesn't have formal semantics, GNU R is the ultimate R reference. Our little greet function is created by the code on the right. As you can see, functions are in effect closures, remembering their list of formal parameters, their body and the lexical environment they originate from. Next, we look at the interface of a function. The append function takes a vector x and adds to it some values at position after. Functions can accept arguments by position, optionally with names. You can specify an optional ellipsis parameter, which will gather any extra arguments not matched by position or name. After the dots, there can be other parameters. These, however, must be passed named. All parameters except the ellipsis may have a default value. This can be any expression and can even refer to the other parameters. Now that we finally have a function created and bound to a name, we would of course like to call it. As you will see, R is very flexible here. There is the straightforward way. And then a number of others. Arguments can be reordered. The defaults changed. The ellipsis passed empty. Or collecting multiple values. Things can get trickier. The default parameter code can be mutually recursive. R has no problem with that, as long as at least one argument is passed. This call will have strange b1 and bizarre 2. In this one both will be 1. However, this call uses both defaults and ends in an infinite recursion. Again, we can pass by name. And if we don't feel like typing too much, R will also happily accept a prefix of a parameter name. We can get weirder still. And if we're not careful about common prefixes, we get burned. All around, calling a function is a lot of hard work in the R world. Every closure application starts with retrieving the target and then creating the list of arguments. The list then needs to be matched to the formals. A fresh execution environment allocated and populated with the matching arguments and the result checked for any missing arguments that could still be salvaged by using their default value. 
only now can the colleague get control and execute. This slide shows the argument matching algorithm itself, about 200 lines of code. To implement its rich semantics, R has to make three passes over the length list of arguments. In short, it first looks for exact named matches. After that, the partial name matching takes place, while looking out for the ellipsis parameter. Finally, the last pass matches the still unused arguments by position and collects the rest in the dots list. So far, we saw the ellipsis in the position of a formal parameter to a function. Let's have a look at how it can be used in the body of the function. First, R provides special by-index accessors in the form of dot dot n symbols. These will simply read out the nth element of ellipsis or throw an error if out of bounds. Second, ellipsis can be passed as an argument at a call site. Here, the semantics is to expand the list as if each element was written by hand. This happens before the argument matching takes place. Note also that the ellipsis captures the names when created. Thus the call to G will return 1, since it will get matched by name in the call to F. R lets us call functions even when we omit some of the arguments. This allows for richer interfaces. For example, this f function can be called either with two vectors giving the x, y coordinates of points to be plotted, or with just one vector giving the y values to be plotted against their indices. Functions can make decisions based on the missingness of their argument. A detail to be aware of is that the built-in missing function will still return true when an argument gets defaulted. Let's look at this function h that returns its second argument. We need to provide at least the argument b. However, leaving out a is fine. More interesting still is the fact that we can omit explicitly. Surprisingly, up till this point we haven't touched on R's laziness at all. In R, arguments are wrapped in promises at a call site. This can save evaluation if an argument isn't accessed in the function. A promise remembers the expression of a given argument and the environment in which the expression should be evaluated. This is, modulo the formals list, the same information that a closure stores. Instead of formals, promises have a slot for memorizing their result. To get a value of an argument, R forces the promise on the first access and returns the saved result afterwards. R is well known for providing easy access to nice plots. All it takes to get a plot is calling this built-in plot function. One might wonder though, how does R know to put the right label to the y-axis without us ever telling it to? The solution, of course, makes use of promises. If we dig a little deeper, we find that the plot function uses the functions dparse and substitute to get the character string versions of the actual arguments. Similar tricks are common to build DSLs in R. Promises can get very tricky, as we will see with this innocent looking age function. This call does exactly what we expect but any expression can be stored in a promise, and we can't be surprised to see side effects. In general, forcing a promise can lead to arbitrary code being executed. At least, R being called by need means the side effects only happen once. Promises have an interesting interaction with control flow. This function passes as a promise the call to the return function. 
if forced, the do return will get called and through find context perform a C long jump. Not out of the promise, however, but out of the no rat. This could mean multiple stack frames getting popped. Depending on what G is, F will either diverge or return 3. The favorite example in our group is the good, the bad and the ugly. Warning, this takes a moment to wrap your head around. Good is a function that creates a local variable ugly and returns it, but in between it also forces its argument. If we pass this call to bad as a promise to good, and we have just the right definition of bad, the promise will reflectively reach into the environment of good and remove the ugly binding from it. This can cause any number of results, ranging from an undefined ugly symbol error to forcing accidental bindings. More fun with side effects. R pretends to keep functions and non-functions separate, and so the C function is not shadowed by the C parameter. But because of laziness, R will force promises while looking up a callee, just to make sure that they are not callable. We saw that function calls are a lot of work. This goes for bookkeeping too. Even after all the arguments matching is done, R keeps around a promargs list, which is the list of the promised arguments as it was before matching. This is used in the implementation of objects, or for instance to find out how many arguments were passed at a call site. In a sense, R is very uniform. Everything happens by calling functions. So far we looked at user-defined functions. These are closures written in R. There are two kinds of built-in functions too. Special forms for constructs such as if that have uncommon argument evaluation rule and built-ins which are used when R wants to be eager. If I assign a variable x even though I use special syntax, R calls the assignment function. When I say if then else, R calls the if special. No surprise then that even a parenthesis is a function. Consider this expression. We can change the meaning of the parentheses and read the benefits. In summary, from the point of view of a compiler, all these details and dynamism are a tough nut to crack. Often we can't solve the problems in isolation, since they are circular in nature. Functions can be redefined in many languages, but in R any variable access can do so. Call sites are difficult even without knowing the callee, but a nightmare with the dynamic ellipsis. Environments are mutable objects, and the binding structure of functions can change under your hands via reflection. Promises combined with reflection and side effects seem to be the common denominator. With this in mind, let's now talk about H, our attempt at taming R. It is a JIT compiler that plugs into GNU R and replaces R's bytecode interpreter. This lets us reuse GNUR's internals, such as the garbage collector, call its built-ins, and for features we don't support, fall back to it. H has a two-tier architecture. From AST we go to REAR, which is a stack-based bytecode interpreter we use for collecting runtime feedback. Code functions are then translated into PEER, an SSA language we use for optimization and in the end lowered to native code using LLVM. I will introduce three of the techniques we use. First, we came up with a different calling convention for peer. Second, we make heavy use of speculation. And third, we compile multiple versions of functions based on the contexts in which they are called.
we simply have to deal with calls. Ideally, we would like to just create the arguments and jump to the callee. However, in R, a new environment is created implicitly when calling a function, and promises are forced implicitly when accessed. To help us reason about R, we made these explicit by introducing instructions to create and manipulate environments, and create and force promises. The slide shows a simplified piece of peer code for the function that adds its argument. We invented a new calling convention. The function's matched arguments are left for it on the operand stack, and the function is called right away. It's the callee that has to create its own environment. All accesses to it are then also explicit, as is forcing when the values are promises. This allows us to track where environments are used, where they leak from the function, where arbitrary effects can occur, and sometimes show that the function doesn't need an environment, and it's safe to not create it. The problem still remains that anything just a little more involved than constant will quickly taint any analysis result. Because of this, we make heavy use of speculation for instance, we use it to guard that functions have not been redefined since compile time. On the slide we have two functions, f, which is just an identity function, and g, which calls f with its own argument. The mechanism we use is based on the paper Correctness of Speculative Optimizations with Dynamic Deoptimization by Olive Lugger et al and it defines speculation using four instructions. First, there is a checkpoint instruction that marks a point to which a misspeculated execution can roll back. It is a branch that has a normal and a deoptimization jump. Second, the assume instruction takes a predicate and a checkpoint and acts as an assert for the predicate. After the assume, analyses can use the predicate for reasoning. The assume is later lowered to a branch on the predicate that can jump to the provided checkpoints the optimization target. We can't allow any side effects between a checkpoint and an assume. The two remaining instructions are used for the optimization. One of them is a frame state and it records metadata needed for reconstructing the state of the program at the checkpoint. This includes the appropriate program counter, the contents of the operand stack, and the environment which is needed by the unoptimized code. The last instruction is an unconditional deoptimization point that using the frame state passes control to the correct place in the unoptimized rear interpreter. With speculation, we can try to statically match the arguments at the call site. In this example, G calls F, but with X and Y swapped. If we assume that F is still the same compile time function, the call can get statically resolved, and the multipass argument matching can happen in the compiler. Our static call instruction can later be compiled to just preparing the arguments and jumping to the target, as opposed to general calls that need to look up their callee and match the arguments at runtime. However, note that because R keeps the promargs list around, we still need to remember the reordering to be able to reconstruct it if needed. Finally, we use contextual dispatching. In H, we track several predicates about the runtime state of a program at a call site. These can be anything, but should be efficiently computable. Our context for the call to G contains the information that there are no explicitly missing arguments, the args are passed in the correct order, there isn't too many of them, and the first argument is an eager non-object scalar real. We can now compile a version of G with these assumptions, as well as dispatch at runtime to the version of G that best matches the current context. 
Of course, we also need to keep a baseline version that makes no assumptions, so that we always have a target to call. This technique is in a sense complementary to inlining, in that it gives the optimizer access to the context in which a function is called. That's all from me. You're welcome to have a look at our GitHub and read about her in more detail in our papers. Thank you.